Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. We got the fan on and the AC is off. It is set at about 78 degrees. So, <laughs> if it gets to about 78, you might hear the AC kick on. I've been trying to work around it. I know most of you haven't been complaining. You've been telling me, don't worry about it. The message is coming through loud and clear. That's all I care about, but I do, um, you know, I do want you to have less distractions so you can really focus on the word that's my job is to try to really get the word to you with no distractions as accurate as possible uh your job is to be filled with the spirit my job is to be filled with the spirit and teach your job is to be filled with the spirit and absorb the word of god so you know we all need to do that and i'm going to do everything on my end to take care of that i'm home alone with my dog tiger lay down buddy lay down <laughs> He's doing better. Thank you, everybody, for asking. Hopefully, he doesn't cough. His coughs are very minimum. Um, we're almost done. I think I got three more days with the meds, you know, the cycle of meds, and I could check in with the vet. But so far, so good. He's only had a couple of minor episodes in the last two days of, like, coughing or hacking up. So thank you so much for the prayer. I appreciate it. Um, don't mind me if my eyes are a little watery. I just did my sinus spray. Um, my eyes were so itchy this morning, and... My sinuses were kicking really bad the other day, so we will deal with that. Let us get ready to jump into it. I can't think if we're praying about anything or anyone, so send me an email if you have any prayers, requests. I try to get them out there. We all gather together in unity, even here online, and we can pray for one another. We need to pray really for our military. Again, I'm going through that cycle of reading things and researching things about our military. It is uh, bad. I don't know any other way to put it plain and simple it's not good um there's a feminization a demasculization of our military there's just a lot of issues going on with it i don't think we can go back to who we were in america and i mean everything our society our military our government i don't think we can go back to who we were you know 15 or 20 years ago i, I just don't i think it's sad but I, I know obviously as a pastor and a christian and a patriot I'm aware that the end times are rapidly approaching, and as I tell people all the time, we have to feel some of this pinch, some of this discomfort and confusion, because the tribulation period is being built all around us. It's been going on for a long time. We're in the time, I believe now, of the escalation of the building of the tribulation period. It's like when you drive by the construction site, and the house is up, and the carpenters are in there, like I tell people, and the electricians are in there putting in the cabinets and setting up the lights you know the house is going to be done soon, whether it's two months or a month or three months, but it's coming to the end. So um, that's the sense I get, and it's sad on one hand, but we're excited on the other because we're believers. We know the end of the story, and if you haven't been clued in, guess what? In your Bible, read it. At the end, we win. <laughs> so um, no, nothing to worry about. We don't go through the tribulation. Do we feel a pinch or some pain with it? Yes, but we are raptured out before the real bad stuff occurs during the seven year tribulation period so having said that i don't really have any major prayers other than that our military i guess i would say so um, we're going to jump into it today's lesson 318 of the matthew series 318 of the matthew series let me get situated here it is uh may 18th year of our lord 2021 may 18th year of our lord 2021 time is tick tick ticking by learn to live in your ambassadorship that's the title today. Learn to live in your ambassadorship. We're going to take a look at that today. We are in Matthew chapter 20. If you want to go there, that's where our study has been. That's where we're at. Matthew 20, 23. We'll pick it up there because in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word. So that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. We are getting prepared to take in the word of God. And in doing so we want to wash the sin from our life. And we want to be able to move forward in the plan of God. Reflecting that new nature. 1 John 1, 1.8 Believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9 If we confess our sins, believers, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us. From all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. I just remembered right now before we pray, um, we want to say congratulations 
Savannah out there has been following the ministry for a while now, supporting the ministry. And I, from what I understand, she's pregnant. So we want to keep her in prayer. So congratulations. And we'll keep Savannah in prayer because she's pregnant. So uh, I knew there was something floating around. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Let's get ready to pray. Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and touch your to touch and listen to your word and, and, and be touched by your word, Father. Right now we're asking you to touch Savannah with the, the baby. And Father, we're just asking that that whole family in North Carolina needs your blessings. They're really good uh, doctrinal people. We just want to send a special blessing out to them. They're very supportive of the channel. So, Father, I'm asking that. I'm asking for the healing hand in the area of vaccines and viruses, Father. I'm asking for all of us to have the strength to go forward, even during these difficult times when our military and our government and our media seem to be falling apart and lying to us and deceptive and different things are happening. Father, we're just asking that you can maybe at this point, Father, give us enough strength to get over that hump where we can start to really grow and focus on your word. If we've been struggling getting over that portion that, that we cannot grow, now is the time, Father, we're asking, give us that extra push today. Give us that extra push this month to move us forward because we need to be prepared for what is coming, Father. We need to evangelize. We need to live in our ambassadorship, as you're gonna, we're going to learn today. And, Father, we're just asking, touch our military and our leaders here in the government. Help them not to dismantle and destroy the great, powerful nation we had here in America. We're just asking for those things. But, obviously, Father, it is your will, not our will, to be done and we're asking for the strength to go forward no matter what happens. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us get ready to jump into it. We got a little wind whipping out there, which means I get a little movement on my canopy out there. So it flaps around sometimes unless I roll it in, which I didn't. So we'll let it flap if it breeze, if the breeze comes strong. Uh, Matthew 20, 23. Matthew 20, 23. He said to them, Jesus speaking to them, my cup is you shall drink. And he's talking to all of them, but he's specifically mentioning John and James here, Salome, Mother Salome approached, we know. But he's speaking loud enough, and obviously all the apostles, disciples are listening. My cup you shall drink, but to sit at my right hand that at my left is not mine to give. This is the humanity of Christ speaking, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ clarified a principle that they did not fully grasp. You can tell by the question they had. But they would in the months and the years ahead after his death, burial, and resurrection. They would grasp and fully understand what he was talking about in the months and years ahead. Now I told you all believers share in the cross of Christ in that our old sin nature was nailed to that cross. But when Jesus Christ says you will share in my cup, what he's talking about is your personal plan, your cup, yourself as well, you are going to have some form of ridicule, attacks, adversity, or sufferings that are going to come your way. Obviously not what Christ went through. But I told you, all believers share in the cross of Christ in that our old sin nature was nailed to the cross. First and foremost, we understand that. Also, every believer will drink a cup related to their relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a portion of your personal plan where you grow toward maturity and in that spiritual journey tests and adversities are set in place for your benefit you do not glorify god when everything goes your way folks when you win the lottery you're not necessarily going to start glorifying god the next day even worse when you fit neatly into the cosmic system you're not really glorifying god so let me say those principles again let them sink in all every believer will drink a cup related to their relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a portion of your personal plan where you grow toward maturity and in that spiritual journey, remember nothing happens overnight, spiritual journey, tests and adversities are set in place for your benefit, for my benefit. You do not glorify God when everything goes your way, folks. You win the lottery and you're going to glorify God. I know a lot of people want to pray that and say that. A lot of Christians, couch potato Christians will say, yeah, when I hit the lottery and when things go my way, then I'll find a way to glorify God. I'll get in the plan. No, it doesn't happen that way, folks. Sorry to tell you. When you eat, which is even worse because you're fitting into the cosmic system, which is even worse. You're not standing out as a believer. You grow during those tests and adversities. And sometimes when you're getting knocked around, that's the time 
you apply your faith. That's the time you apply the word of God. That's the time you grow and you glorify God. Matthew 20, 24 goes on to say what in verse 24? And after hearing this, the other ten disciples became indignant with the two brothers. We have a lack of maturity here, folks. That's really what's going on. Because now everyone is ignited from their emotional response, thinking John and James may get preferential treatment. May get preferential. This happens in churches as well. Somebody will talk to the pastor or the deacon or this one or that one, and they'll feel in the congregation like they're getting special treatment. They have no idea what the conversation's about or what's really going on behind the scenes, but they start to get aggravated because they feel somebody is getting preferential treatment. That's immaturity, folks, okay? Hypersensitivity bubbles to the surface, which always comes out eventually from people who lack the knowledge and control over their emotions. That's really all this is all about. Yes, they're born-again believers. Yes, they're on the journey. We understand all those things. But they're really lacking in knowledge and growth. They can't control their emotions. There's a level of immaturity here. It is a sign and symbol, really, of either an unbeliever or an immature believer, which is the case here. Immaturity is the issue. Now, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ reels them back in the, into the reality of spiritual growth and operating in the kingdom of God compared to operating in the world. What's he going to do? He's going to kind of shift or pivot a little bit, and he's going to reel them back in and talk about spiritual growth operating in the kingdom of God compared to what the world offers you, what the world does, which are two different things. Matthew 20, 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said what? Now he says, gather around. Let's straighten this issue out, fellas. <laughs> you know that the rulers of the Gentiles domineer over them. He's talking about the world and the Romans, really, and those in high positions exercise authority over them. That is the cosmic protocol, cosmic system, not a godly protocol. Matthew 10, uh, 20, 26 on the board. We're going to look at some principles here. It is not this way among you. In other words, Christian life, the kingdom of God here on earth is not this way among you, but whoever wants to become prominent, mean wants to set them place, themselves up in a place of authority in the elite, among you shall be your servant verse 27 and whoever desires to be first among you shall be your slave i tell people all the time and i was taught this over the years as well if you want to be in a position of leadership in the church be careful you're not overly zealous or overly emotional because only god can promote you it has to happen at the right time his timing in the right way but if you do get elevated to some form of position in a church of authority really any position of authority understand authority is there to serve not just dictate that goes for a husband that goes for a father that goes for the boss on the job that goes for the pastor and the deacons really it covers authority on a lot of levels if you want to do things god's way or you want to do things the world's way that's what jesus is pointing out matthew 20 28 just as the son of man jesus is saying did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many because the disciples are so saturated, really, with Roman Empire. That's all around them. Roman power, Roman government, and even the chain of command in the Jewish power structure like the Sanhedrin. That is how they viewed spiritual authority and rewards. That's how they, vi they viewed getting rank and file and rewards and be getting rewarded. How the Roman Empire handled things, how the Sanhedrin handled things. That's what they were thinking. They want to be in a position wearing the nice clothing and the jewelry and, and jewelry and being elevated, whether it's financially or in the, in the crowd and the social status, and people can look and ooh and ah at them, but that they didn't understand God's plan. It's the same way most people in the world today view power, they view authority and rewards. It is the devil's worldview, which we, we call the cosmic viewpoint. That's the devil's worldview, which is cosmic viewpoint. Rank and power is only recognized by the masses and established by wealth or popularity and the majority who bow down to it in the world. Let me say that again. Rank and power, if we think about it, in a devil's world is only recognized by the masses and established by wealth or popularity or something. Knowing somebody, being popular, having wealth, some form of attention, and the majority begin to bow down and everybody follows suit. That's their vision. That's the worldly vision, really, of power, rank, and authority. The kingdom of heaven, in its current temporal state, understand that, underline that, current temporal state is within each believer's soul. I told you this before, but also it is established and witnessed when the body of Christ, there's the AC, 
when the body of Christ works in unity in this lost and dying world. So you have to understand the kingdom of heaven. I've explained this to you before. It's a pretty wide terminology, a very big blanket terminology to understand. So the kingdom of heaven in its current temporal state, when we talk about that here on earth, church age, is within each believer's soul, but also it is established and witnessed when the body of Christ, talking about unity here, works in unity in this lost and dying world. We display the kingdom. We're, we're interacting with the kingdom of God. We're spreading the kingdom of God in the world. The kingdom of heaven as a whole has always existed, always will, always was. It will always exist, has always, because it is the very atmosphere around the triune God of the universe. So wherever the triune God of the universe is, around that atmosphere, wherever he says <laughs> is, is heaven, it's heaven. So it's always existed. So you need to understand that. There is an incredible expansion coming in the future. An expansion after the tribulation and then again really after the thousand years of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So please take note on that. Understand the different definitions, different levels when we talk about kingdom of heaven and how it can be here on earth because it's actually in your soul structure. Listen, if you have the Trinity, the triune God inside of you, you are the kingdom of heaven. You reflect the kingdom of heaven. Understand those principles. When the church gets together in unity, even across the internet like this, we come together and pray, lift each other up and get the word out there. We're working in the kingdom. We're displaying the kingdom of heaven. Please understand those principles. I'll give you a moment to jot them down. I've explained this before. I think most people get it, but you'd be surprised some of the emails and questions you get as the weeks and months roll on. I don't mind when I have time, I answer them. And I always tell people, if you're just reading my Facebook notes, they're raw notes, and you're not watching the message and coinciding the Facebook notes with the message, you're, you might not get the whole message. I'm just letting you know, a lot of people on Facebook just read the notes. I found that out a couple of weeks ago when somebody asked me a question, and I said, you really didn't listen to the message. He said, no, I just read the notes. So I said, you're not getting the whole message. You're getting about 80% of the message because the raw notes are just to keep me in line and guide me. That's all my work goes into those. And then God, the Holy Spirit, starts coming forth and uses me however he's going to use me during the message. And I clarify certain principles. Many people lose that. Also, the notes are very raw. So I, I, uh, there's even mistakes in them I see sometimes. I try to correct them to the best of my ability, but those are my notes. I know what they say. <laughs> I'm just doing that as a courtesy for some people who like to read them. You should really do both. You should really do both. Listen to the message and look at the notes if you're going to do that. So I know questions will come. Jesus Christ did not come in his first advent to receive the ministry of others. He wasn't here in his first advent to receive ministry from others, but instead he came to minister and to give his life a ransom for many he came to serve always remember that therefore we reflect he's the protocol plan for us we reflect Jesus Christ if we're walking accurately the eternal kingdom of heaven will display greater power rank and authority than any earthly worldly human uh, uh, empire that was ever built anything mankind developed the kingdom of heaven will blow it away I think you all are pretty aware of that the kingdom of heaven right now, in the temporal sense, the temporal definition, is within the life of the believer and the unity of a church. Now you can have, because if you look at what Paul, Peter, many of the apostles did, they were writing letters and visiting different areas. Today we have the internet. There's different ways you can come together in unity if there's not a building down the road that you can go to and get truth. So understand that the eternal kingdom of heaven will display greater power, rank, and authority than any empire mankind has ever developed. The kingdom of heaven right now in the temporal sense, temporal definition, is within the life of the believer and the unity of the body of Christ, the church, church age believers, which must reflect the humanity and mission of Jesus Christ leading up to that cross. Which must reflect who? Jesus Christ. The humanity and the mission of Jesus Christ leading up to the cross. We have to be in that vein of who and what Jesus Christ was. And who he is, obviously, always will be. In other words, Jesus Christ became a slave by dying on that cross, when you think about it. He became a slave to a system here, a very flawed system here, and he purposely did so 
to go to that cross for us. Jesus Christ was consistently preaching and teaching God's word to heal and guide others away from Satan's cosmic system and the lies. That was his life. Is that your life? I don't know. Ask yourself. He became a minister to the human race by his work of salvation, by his words, everything, his deeds. And the point is that Jesus Christ will be the greatest in the spiritual kingdom, obviously, because he became a slave. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. We know that in scripture, in history. He was the only one born outside of the slave market of sin, which points to the doctrine of redemption. Let me say that one again, because we might have to touch on that, because some of this leads us in this direction a little bit. He became a minister to the human race by his works, his deeds, obviously salvation. And the point is that Jesus Christ will be the greatest and always was the greatest in the spiritual kingdom because he became a slave. He allowed himself. He became obedient to the point of death on that cross. He was the only one born outside of the slave market of sin, which points to the doctrine of redemption. His earthly ministry and his work on the cross teaches us he became a slave to free the human race from the bondage of sin. So he purposely accepted this form of slavery. Listen, when you think about it, when you think about Jesus Christ and his humanity, God and his becoming flesh, the doctrine of the hypostatic union, it's like you saying, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to get out, uh, this isn't me to be insult the human race, but I'm going to, I'm going to become a cockroach so I can go work with those insects and lead them in the right direction because I love them so much. And I'll remain 100% human, you know, powerful as I am, and I'm going to still remain 100% cockroach and go forward with that. I don't know any other way to look at it. I laugh when I say that. I try to say things to make you chuckle and relax, but realize what Jesus Christ did. His earthly ministry and work on the cross teaches us he became a slave to free the human race from the bondage of, sl of sin, save us from the slave market of sin. Christ in his humanity and his ministry of service, which culminated upon that cross for the human race, makes him first in the spiritual kingdom, but he became first by serving, be being what? A servant, the servant savior for all of us. He has many titles. Jesus Christ has got about, I think it's like 28 or 30 titles, a whole bunch of titles for Christ. One day we'll cover them all, but he became first by being the servant and the Savior. Never forget his servanthood for all of us. Like I told you before, last lesson and previous lessons, Christ died for everybody. Yes, the unbeliever across the street from you who ridicules your Bible study and your Christianity. Christ died for him. His old sin nature, that unbeliever that ridicules you, was nailed to the cross. If he wants to accept it before he dies, accept Christ, then that old sin nature is there. If not, he's going to stand with that old sin nature in his flesh and be judged for that. For the church age believer, their calling after salvation encompasses a role as an ambassador. Many of you know this. If not, you're hearing it today, which points to a service for the country they now represent. What does an ambassador do? They represent their country when they travel. They represent their country, and they have to do it in a proper manner. You don't just send anybody out to be an ambassador. They can make an embarrassment for your country or cause a problem, maybe even a war, if they don't handle themselves the right way. Go to their meetings, say the right things, do the right things. Ambassador represents another country. Think about that for a moment. Yes, you're an ambassador. Whether you want to be or not, if you're a believer, you're an ambassador. You're just not living it in your ambassadorship. A lot, of, a lot of folks are. What the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was trying to wake his followers up to was the fact that leadership, rewards, and authority resembles something different in God's plan for the believer in time when the world, how the world promotes things. Listen to me. When Christ was trying to wake these guys up, and the ladies there, and all the disciples, if you look at Matthew 19 into 20, what we've gotten into, Christ is really trying to wake his followers up to the fact that leadership, rewards, crowns, blessings, authority resembles something different in God's plan for the believer in time than what the world might promote. And then there's also eternal crowns and blessings. He was trying to highlight a lot here in, in Matthew 19 into 20, understanding that after salvation there are some titles that occurred along with those grace gifts given at salvation, and one is ambassador understand this we talked about the grace gifts 
Yes, a lot of things happen at the moment of salvation. A lot of wonderful and great things, spiritual things, things that you can use in the temporal, things that are going to go into eternity with you. Grace, gifts, at salvation. and But one of them is has to do with titles that you were given. One is an ambassador. Every believer is called to be an ambassador for Christ, a representative of heaven. You are whether you choose to be or not. You're a believer. You represent heaven. The Apostle Paul, even during his famous prison epistle letters, never forgot what the calling is for church-age believers. Even when Paul was locked up, he did some of his best writing when he was locked up. Ephesians 6.18, that's not to say let's go get locked up somewhere and do some great writing. I don't know what your, your skill set is when you're locked behind bars the way he was. That's a, that's a great study. Um, if you ever want to get into the historic jail cells and where Paul had to go and how uncomfortable and difficult it was. Sometimes he was chained to other prisoners or chained to Roman guards. No privacy. That's a whole other study for another day. Don't ever, don't ever look down your nose on Paul. I'll tell you right now. He was a pretty unbelievable guy. I don't care if the historians will tell you that his presence wasn't strong. He might not have spoke with strength or something. He looked kind of funky. Most historians believe he had a big nose, a bald head. He wasn't much to look at. Had a nasally voice maybe when he spoke. It wasn't that impressive. His writing and who and what he, he was and what he did was incredible. Don't ever look down your nose on Paul. Ephesians 6.18, with every prayer, Paul says and writes and request, pray at all times in the spirit, not in the flesh. And with this in view, be alert with all perseverance, every request for all saints. What is he saying? The call is to focus on others, but think about the others here. This, is, this gets lost sometimes as well. Turn to Romans chapter 8, royal family. Romans chapter 8. I want to say something when you guys go to Romans chapter 8. The focus right here, you're looking at in Ephesians 6, 18, is on other believers first. Yes, and I'm telling you that as well. Because when we nurture and protect each other, the body of Christ, it remains strong, and the mission of saving unbelievers, we can then forge forward. You can't do anything if you're not strong. That's one of the reasons God wants you to have your bills in order and have your life in order and be strong enough first before you start giving and serving. I don't know a lot of pastors won't tell you that. They don't care. Some pastors that are all about getting in your pocket, they'll tell you. I'm one of the few, I think, that'll tell you if you need me to send a check back because you need to pay your bills, please let me know. I don't ever want that to happen. You need to be in a position of strength for you to help others. That's in the Bible. So when some pastor or some preacher is reaching in your pocket trying to make you feel guilty and telling, and which kills me when I see these guys on evangelical TVs and they're telling some old lady to, to sow that seed of a $800 or $1,000 and that's their check for the whole month and God will take care of them. I get a little enraged with that. I have to rebound with that. I hate that stuff. I hate greedy people that would do that to the elderly or the innocent. Very sad. But notice the call, focus on others, but the others are believers. Believers because when we nurture and protect each other, the body of Christ remains strong and the mission of saving unbelievers, we can forge forward and do it. If we're weak and confused, we fail in that mission. If you're weak and confused in your personal life, you will fail to lift up the word of God. So always make sure you get your sleep, get your rest, get your vitamins, get your exercise, take care of your bills and your family, then you start realizing what can I do for the Word of God and how can I lift up God's plan. Ephesians 6, 19. You guys are going to Romans chapter 8. I'm sorry I threw it in there. My notes are a little backwards. Like I said, they're very raw. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 19. And pray in my behalf, Paul goes on to say, that speech may be given to me in opening my mouth. Paul is saying, pray for me. I'm in difficult prison situations that I can open my mouth to make known with boldness, Paul says, the mystery, mystery doctrine of the gospel, verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, as we all ought to speak, boldly, stand in truth boldly. Paul knew his calling was one of leadership as an apostle who had to help define and teach mystery doctrine of the church age. He knew what his calling was. His ambassadorship was specific within his calling. Yours will be too. It's no different for you and I. Paul's ambassadorship encompassed his apostleship 
writing the New Testament, establishing churches, doing what he had to do, that was part of his ambassadorship. I don't know what yours is. I know I'm trying to do mine. We all have it. The basic call for the ambassador believer in the church age is to use your own platform or circle of influence and represent the kingdom of God. In your own little circle of influence, represent the kingdom of God. Listen, you might only evangelize to two people through your whole life. If you do the right, do it the right way to the right two people at the right time during God's timing and you fill with the Spirit, those two people might affect a hundred. You simply don't know. And you have crowns and blessings waiting for you because you were a good ambassador at the right time. To represent the divine kingdom, you had better understand the power source of the one who sent you. You had better understand the power source, what you have to tap into for the one who sent you. Romans 8.14. That's where we're at. Romans 8.14. I'll put it on the board so you guys can follow along. Romans 8.14. For all who are being led by the Spirit, underlying that, Spirit of God, these are sons and daughters of God. Verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery. I don't care what the world is telling you. I see a lot of these signs, and I love them, that says faith, not fear, related to all this COVID craziness. Faith, not fear. For you have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by which we cry out, Abba, Father, very, very intimate cry here, a child running to their father. This is an intimacy in what we receive that is beyond just being an ambassador. So if you find it hard that you're called to be an ambassador, realize the intimacy you're called in the first place, and then everything else will fall into place. There's an intimacy in what we receive that is beyond just being an ambassador, folks. The reason we can cry out, Abba, Father, which is an Aramaic term, even though the Greeks kind of twisted it in their language a little bit. It came from the Aramaic originally. But it's a term of endearment that a child uses when they run the arms of their father, like a little child screaming out Papa and running to their father's arms. Very affectionate. This is a victory cry as well. It's a love cry out loud. It's something excitable. It's a good thing. It's a good cry, like a victory, a child crying out loud, Papa. And the Papa scoops that child up. This is Paul really showing intimate love toward God the Father because he's invested in the doctrine of adoption. He knows it. And it's very exciting to him. It should be to you. Because in the ancient world, it meant a family took you in fully and completely. No half-stepping when you got adopted in the ancient world, unlike adoption today. You became like a true child of that father. And Paul was excited about that. Romans 8.16, he's trying to get everybody else excited about it. The Spirit himself, Romans 8.16, Paul goes on to say, testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. We know this because we are walking in the Spirit and God is working with us. There's, there is communication between you and God the right way. Romans 8.17, and if children, and if you are, yes... Heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ in union, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This is saying yes, and it is true. Heirs in the ancient world were guaranteed to receive the family wealth and family inheritance. All heirs in the ancient world, different than it is today, all heirs in the ancient world received family wealth and inheritance. When you were adopted, in the ancient world, it was because the family, or more specifically, the father, head of household, was very fond of you and really wanted to adopt you. So it's a different adoption than what we see today. I've explained this one before. There was no government check for adopting a child thousands of years ago. I'll just put it that way. You run with that how you feel. Because we share in such a great inheritance, Paul reminds the church at Rome, Romans 8, 18, he goes on to say, For I consider the suffering, because we've adopted, and all these things, these heir, we're heirs, all these things were in union with Christ, all these wonderful things I'm excited about, that I can cry, Abba, Father, and run into the arms of the Father. For I consider the sufferings of this present time, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul's very excited in writing this and teaching this principle. I can tell you right now. Romans 8, 19, if you understand the original Greek, there's some excitement in what Paul is talking about here. 
For the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. You and I, believers, royal family. Through God's divine judgment and in his timing, all will be revealed. And that includes believers and unbelievers, winners and losers as well. Let me say that again. Through God's divine timing, his judgment, and his evaluations, everything he does, all will be revealed, and that includes believers and unbelievers, winners and losers as well, in time and eternity. Jump over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Go to Paul's teaching, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me, royal family. I find it very interesting if you really understand how excited Paul was in this adoption principle really kind of lit him up and he was trying to explain it and get everybody fired up about it because it really meant something in the ancient world how difficult is it to be an ambassador for your family that's a good question to ask because that's what it's all really all about think about that statement and ask yourself how difficult would it be to be adopted into a foreign kingdom that is loaded with wealth and prosperity and peace a place where you were entered into royalty and truly loved then you were asked to travel for a period of time and represent the values and standards of that new country and that new kingdom that you were adopted into and taken care of so well. All the while you were under the protective wings and blessings of the king because he loves you so much of that country. He simply desires an intimate relationship with you and he will do all the work for all your journeys. You just represent him. Think about it. That's what I'm telling you. That's the type of ambassador you are. You're an ambassador, but you're a child of God as an ambassador. So think about that, the intimate relationship. Romans 8, 28 would tell, to, tell us, and we've gone over this before, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good. <clears throat> Excuse me, for those who, what, stop into church once in a while? Pray every other Sunday? Drop a $20 bill in the bucket? Think about it. We know, Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who check the box, no. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, they are in the plan, they are intimate with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and with God, and with God the Holy Spirit is active in their life. For those believers who establish an intimate relationship with him, God is able to release greater temporal blessings and rewards to work all things in your favor. He is. But there is a maturity level you want to reach. That is why it's so important to grow up spiritually, folks. Because what you gain in time will be greater insight, discernment, more spiritual power to handle the adversities. And God will begin to release blessings in the temporal, understand that, temporal, that you can live in and use right now today. Everything was done for you in eternity past. I'm going to say that again. For those believers... Romans 8, 28 is a fact for those believers who establish an intimate relationship with him. God is able to release greater temporal blessings in time and rewards to work all things in your favor, which is going to carry into eternity. This is why it's so important to grow up spiritually, because what you gain in time will be greater insight, spiritual discernment, spiritual IQ, power, spiritual power to handle the adversities and God will begin to release blessings in the temporal that you can live in and use right now in time because it was already done in eternity past what am I telling you take advantage of what God already gave you somebody already gave you something your wealthy father adopted you already and he's already given you millions of dollars in a credit card and he's saying use them but use them wisely why wouldn't you start using them? Take advantage of it. You cannot gain this type of growth until you recognize who you are in Christ. Do you recognize who you are in Christ? Philippians 3.20 tells us what Paul teaches there. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 21, who will, matter-of-fact statement, who will transform the body of our lowly condition into conformity with his glorious body by the exertion of the power that he has even subject all things to himself it is done in eternity past polatuma is the word you're looking at 
on the board. Some of you know it, citizenship. It's the Greek noun they use for citizenship. It meant to be affiliated with the government in, in good standing as a member of that society or that political leadership. You're involved, you're in it, and you're in good standing. It speaks to membership in good standing. Polatuma. The Philippians were Romans who lived in Philippi, and all around them were Greeks, Macedonians, Jews, all kinds of people all around them. But in Philippi, they were Polatuma, citizens of Rome, which meant power and authority if you were a citizen of Rome. It's one of the reasons Paul was spared more than once facing death with the Romans. Rome was just as much Rome in that spot in northern Greece as it was anywhere else, in other words. Paul is using that word as an illustration to these people, for here is the royal family of God living in the devil's world. Think about it. And yet it is just as much royal family as anywhere in heaven is the analogy. Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. Let me say that one again. Rome was just as much Rome in that spot in northern Greece, Philippi, as it was anywhere else. Paul is using that word as an illustration to these people. For here is the royal family of God living in the devil's world. And yet, it is just as much royal family as anyone in heaven in that analogy he's teaching. Colonel R.B. Theme Jr. There, there is no need to reinvent the wheel when a great pastor, a great theologian, before me, or before you if you're teaching, have already written it down so eloquently. There's no need to reinvent the wheel if it's already been invented and written down so eloquently. Sometimes during your study, you're like, you look at somebody like a Colonel R.B. Theme Jr., Lewis Ferry Schaefer, Charles Spurgeon, or even I chuckle sometimes and see certain things written or said by J. Vernon McGee, which he's very country and very basic, and it gets right where the rubber meets the road and hits the point. Why try to change it? That's not your job to reinvent the wheel. If you want to be a pastor, you're not reinventing the wheel, folks. Just so you know, men, if you want to be a pastor, you don't get all kinds of new heavy revies and make up things as you go. Please beware of that. 2 Corinthians 5.17, that's where we're going. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, Paul says, if anyone, Greek first class condition, when you guys know this, and it's true, if anyone, and it's true, is in Christ, if you are, this person is a new creation. Point blank truth. New creation in Christ. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Point blank truth, if and it is true, Greek first class condition. Part of that new creation is the title of divine royalty and ambassadorship. A couple of the titles. Divine royalty, ambassadorship. 2 Corinthians 5.18. Now, all these things are from God. It's grace. It's all grace. You can't earn or deserve it. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, another doctrinal principle related to the cross of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.19, namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, taking care of this whole situation, the old sin nature, not counting their wrongdoings against them, and he was committed to us, the word of reconciliation. Doctrine of the hypostatic union, sound familiar? Right there, Jesus Christ is God. And he is man. 100% God, 100% man. God worked in Christ because he is Christ. Triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Separate, three separate beings. Yes, I know it's hard to wrap your finite mind around it, but one God. 2 Corinthians 5.20. Yes, I teach triune God. Three separate beings. Christ being the only human being out of the Trinity. But three separate beings, all one God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 on the board. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ because the part of the new creation is a title called ambassadorship for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. God works through you. It's called theandric action. We reflect God making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You realize when you're walking in that new nature, you're reflecting the protocol plan of God, and it shows the hyperstatic union. We talk about 
Christ being 100% man, 100% God, yes, he is and always will be. But here on earth, when we are walking in that new nature, applying his word, it's the antric action, some theologies, uh, theologians call it, the antric action. It reflects God's nature in us, which is the doctrine of the hypostatic union. Understand that. We're connected to Christ. So therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Making an appeal through us is the Greek verb parakleo. That sounds familiar? Parakleo, making an appeal through us. That's the Greek verb parakleo, which is from the root words where we get parakletos from in the Greek, God the Holy Spirit, the helper. Sound familiar? Parakleto, parakletos. Get the God, the Holy Spirit, the helper. Scriptures like what? John 14, 26, the helper. The one who comes alongside of us, guides us. The legal advisor, the legal counselor, the one who puts his arm around you and guides you. That's what he's saying. So what does that mean? We are called to operate in a similar fashion for those lost in the world when we are filling our role as amb <clears throat> excuse me, ambassadors. We're slowly guiding like the Holy Spirit does to us, we're being a helper to others and guiding them and saying, take a look at my nation, take a look at my kingdom, where I came from. And oh yes, Jesus Christ is the one who enters you into that kingdom. We guide somebody, we are called to operate in similar fashion for those lost in the world when we fill our roles as ambassadors. Second Corinthians 5.21, he made him who knew no sin, you guys know this, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Might become. We might become. Points to the free will we all have, folks. And as an ambassador, you gently explain things and realize people have free will. You can guide them. You can guide the horse to water, but they have to drink. You know the saying. Free will. There's always a choice before salvation. There's always a choice after salvation to not walk in your ambassadorship. I want to close this out today with some pertinent points on ambassadorship. Some pertinent points. I think really most of you understand these. But really, if you've never heard this term before, never fully digested it, hopefully today you're really going to absorb it and think about what an ambassador does in the spiritual and the natural realm. An ambassador does not appoint himself or herself. They don't. They, they have to be chosen. So after salvation... You are chosen, all we all are. He's appointed by the nation he represents, the king or the leader he represents, really. As ambassadors, we are appointed by God the Father because God the Father was in Christ, what? Reconciling the world to himself. We just saw that. Please take a note on that. Please absorb these and understand these. I'm going to show you the natural, and there are some spiritual analogies wrapped up in this ambassadorship. Christ is now at the right hand of the Father, we are representing him on this earth. Christ is where? Seated. Is he inside of you? Yes. But we also know he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. We are representing him now here on earth. After salvation, whether you choose to believe it or not, that's one of your callings. An ambassador doesn't support himself. I'm not telling you not to go to work. I want you to understand the spiritual and natural, and I'll point some things out. The country or king makes sure that ambassador has logistical supplies, what they need to get through, that we know we can look at as logistical grace blessings in the spiritual realm. We have to look at the spiritual and line it up with the natural. The only time the ambassador would lose support of his or her daily needs is if the king was weak and couldn't come through for us. We know that's not true. Or that ambassador, very important principle, that ambassador has stepped outside of their calling, their title, and no longer performed their duties. You see an ambassador from another country, and they start saying, the heck with representing my country. I'm going to come to this nation over here, this other country, where I'm supposed to represent my king or my nation, my leadership, and I'm going to live like hell and just jump into all this craziness. They eventually lose their title, lose their job. Just so you know, they no longer perform those duties. We know our king is not a weakling, he's not a liar, and we can count on him, so the rest is what? Up to you. There's the R word again, responsibility. I use that occasionally, the R word. Some people want to go, la, 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 not hear it. Responsibility. 
The protection against enemy forces and disaster is also laid out in the protocol plan for the ambassador as they travel. The protection against enemy forces or disasters is also laid out in the protocol plan before that ambassador even travels, really. And though some discomfort or adversity can come in any nation at any time, the ambassador has a level of protection and security that he or she, depending on who they are, knows their military and government has their back and they will retrieve them and fight for them. Let me say that one again. Important principle. Though some discomfort or adversity can come into any nation when you're an ambassador, you're traveling, it can happen at any time, that ambassador has a level of protection and security that he or she knows their military, their government, their king has their back and they will be retrieved and they will be fought for tooth and nail if anything happens to them. The fact that we are part of a spiritual warfare and this church age is the intensified stage of the angelic conflict and it is, we are totally and completely sustained and protected by God. You step out of that protection, that's on you. You step out of your ambassadorship or the plan, that's on you. We're in his plan and cannot be removed from this world as long as God's purpose for your ministry continues. You ever think about that? You don't want to be well, yeah, born again and say, I don't want to be an ambassador. I don't want to live in my believer priesthood. I don't want to evangelize. I don't want to support ministry. I don't want to be a soldier for Christ. I don't want to do any of these. That's fine. God's long-suffering. He'll let you go for quite a long time. You, you'd be surprised. Because remember, a day is a thousand years to God. But we are in his plan. We cannot be removed from the world as long as God's purpose for your ministry continues. You can take that and digest it how you believe. I'm not giving you any threats from the word of God. I'm just telling you it's biblical. An ambassador does not represent himself, first and foremost. Keep that in the back of your mind. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, the initiation into divine status is already achieved. You're already there. So don't tell me, I don't want that title. It's already achieved. It happened at salvation. Therefore, your mission and calling as ambassador is underway, whether you choose to live in it or not. You can be that couch potato, couch potato Christian that I make a joke about occasionally. It's up to you. I can tell you there's a consequences when your free will goes in a positive or a negative direction. And God is long-suffering, so you figure it out. There comes a time when the ambassador will be called home and his or her mission and accomplishments will be what? Evaluated or judged, however you want to look at it. Now, you can never lose your salvation. So don't think that's what I'm telling you. That's not what I'm teaching. I'm just telling you. There comes a time when we look at the natural and spiritual when the ambassador will be called home and his or her mission and accomplishments will be evaluated. What did you do? What did you do with the time I gave you? What did you do with the training I gave you? What did you do with the words I gave you? Whatever it is, what did you do with that time as an ambassador? As the salvation door is open, we have to remember that our purpose in life has now radically changed. As that salvation door opened, your purpose in life radically changed. God will sit back and wait several years for you to start figuring things out, but eventually you have to take some responsibility. Believer priest, ambassador, royal family member, soldier for Christ. The list of grace, blessings, and authority is much greater now that you're born again and saved, folks. It just simply is. All ambassadors have to be trained and prepared for their journey and position. Underline that one. All ambassadors have to be prepared for their journey and, and that position. They need some training, preparation. Ambassadors have a criteria as well as instructions in written form. We have instructions in written form. Hopefully that's your Bible in front of you, the mind of Jesus Christ. What you're doing right now, trying to figure out your instructions. There's an expect, expectation of etiquette and poise. There's an expectation in the natural and spiritual for ambassadors of etiquette, knowing how to handle situations, and poise, meaning you know how to maneuver yourself and not lose your cool under pressure that all ambassadors must master. Yes, it takes a little time. God will give you the time. He'll give you the information. It's up to you to move forward. 
our purpose in life is to represent the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to enter into the spiritual conflict which exists in this fallen world that's all around you, as well as the historical impact of the dispensation you live in. So in other words, there's spiritual warfare going around. You have to acknowledge and get involved occasionally. You gotta pick up your rifle once in a while after basic training and engage in battle occasionally. And you, it, what kind of impact do you have in the historical dispensation that you're in? Those are questions that are gonna be asked at your evaluation. And since we are his representatives, everything is in his hands under his power his hands, his power. Therefore, we've been given techniques, skills, and problem-solving devices in order to place problems and pressure in proper context, because they are going to come, but you place them in proper context and then learn how to hand them over to him and say, how do you want me to deal with this, Lord, as your ambassador? The ambassador doesn't belong to that country to which he was sent. Again, keep that in the back of your mind. Our citizenship is in heaven now. And like an ambassador in the natural realm, we flow between what? Two countries gracefully with purpose. You have purpose and grace, but only remain loyal to the one, the heavenly, Jesus Christ. Not allowing foreign customs and foreign standards to stop or manipulate your mission or change your loyalties. Understand that in the natural and spiritual realm. Not allowing foreign customs and foreign standards to stop our mission or change our loyalties, change sides. You're no longer an ambassador, you're stepping outside that title, which will be taken away from you. The title, not your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. You are on the wrong channel, if that's what you believe. I could teach you, as I said, go back on this page or I'll stick around for a while, I'll cover that as well. But there is repercussions. Don't change your loyalties or lose the mission. There is a sense in which our highest responsibility belongs to the Lord. It's always in your mind. Though we walk among this world and should participate in this world, absolutely you're called to participate. We're not to place eternal value in it. We are not to place eternal value while we participate in it. Our eternal value is in the heavenly. We're looking forward to what lies ahead, not remembering what lies behind. That is what's mentioned in scriptures like John 17, 11 through 16, reminding us we're not of the world. Get into John chapter 17. We are not of the world anymore. Romans 12, 2. James 4, 4 tells us friendship with the world is antagonistic to the plan of God. Romans 12, 2. James 4, 4. Read them. Tells us friendship with the world is antagonistic towards God, the plan of God. The spiritual ambassador for Christ must participate, must participate, and can even serve well in roles in the military, law enforcement, government positions, day-to-day -day life, yes. Yet they always work and live a life that is dedicated and reflective of the Christian values because ultimately that is where their citizenship is rooted. So while you're working and displaying and participating your life here in the world you keep realizing I'm not of the world I'm a citizen of heaven therefore when I'm working amongst those in the world participating and displaying myself among those in the world I need to do it a little bit better because I'm a Christian not out of arrogance not out of your flesh just have a more pure outlook about things a pure way of applying yourself to things because you are doing things as unto Christ not onto the devil's world. That is why a true Christian, a true Christian, one who really understands biblical standards, lives in them, make great soldiers, they make great employees, they make great friends and family members when they fully understand their Bible and live in it. True Christians, they make great soldiers, they make great employees, they make great friends, they respect authority and protocol, they never cut corners or cheat to get ahead unlike the ambassadors we see at the United Nations and such government positions across the globe the spiritual ambassador operates from virtue character and integrity virtue character integrity you don't see that in many ambassadors across the world certainly in places like 
the EU and the UN. Don't get me started on those demonic bodies of government, worldly, globalist, elite government. An ambassador representing his country does not operate from a position of hypersensitivity and weakness. Does not. Therefore, they rarely take anything personal. It's hard to hurt their feelings. Spiritual analogy in that as well. Think about an ambassador in the natural realm. They can't have their feelings hurt every meeting they go to. They're from another country and the Americans insult them. They need to be careful. They need to have poise and etiquette and keep their cool, not hypersensitive and weak. Therefore, they rarely take anything personal. This has to do with maturity, really. Integrity from a relaxed mental attitude in the soul. They know how to relax. They have poise. That's what poise means. Relaxed mental attitude. Because you know who your king is. And you know the king of this world, small k, is nothing. And you're doing the best you can to wake these people up to your kingdom, saying, you might want to come to my kingdom. Let me show you who my God is, my king is. You always maintain your cool, realizing you are representing the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You always maintain your cool. I know you're going to fail sometimes. We all do. This is what you should strive for. Having that relaxed mental attitude representing the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When the ambassador is swiftly recalled from a country, that is tantamount to a declaration of war. Think about it. When they pull them out quick, usually means something is brewing. Maybe war, maybe conflict, maybe something bad. For the church age believer ambassador, the rapture of the church will be that swift recall. That'll be our swift recall, folks. Because the ambassador is always under the protection of the king, and no one touches the king's anointed without severe repercussions. Let me say that one again. No one touches the king's anointed without severe repercussions. And yet, yeah, in his timing, in his way, severe repercussions when you touch the anointed ambassador of the true king. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Father, we thank you for this time. Bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world. And again, Father, we're just asking you to touch and bless those that lift these ministries up through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.